Hello, everyone, and welcome to VTC 2021. My name is Dave Curran. I'm the Elementary School Instructional Coach for Technology, and I'm a member of the VTC committee. It's my honor today to welcome to you all Dr. Gina Ryan, who will be talking to us about stage or mirror alter egos in online platforms. Gina Ryan is an honorary professor at Piap University and the senior school music teacher at Prem Tinsalananda International School. I hope I got that right in Chiang Mai in Thailand. She has performed in Canada, United States, Japan, China, France, Mexico, and Thailand, and has presented at various conferences in North America and Asia. Her research has been published in Action Criticism, Theory for Music Education, Canadian Music Educator, Research Studies in Music Education, Percussive Notes, The Instrumentalist, and Psychology of Music. Dr. Ran holds music performance and music pedagogy degrees from McGill University, University of Toronto, Memorial University, of Newfoundland. She's been a jury member for the Chiang Mai Ginastera International Music Festival and as a curriculum reviewer and workshop leader for the IB. Whew. Take a breath. How privileged and honored are we to have someone like Dr. Ryan join us today. This is going to be an absolutely amazing workshop. I hope you're all very excited for it. There will be opportunities throughout the workshop for you to ask questions, to contribute, and when those opportunities come along, Gina will ask you to use the raise hand feature. So please do um, contribute, get involved, be engaged with everybody, and then don't forget to unmute your mic when it's your turn to speak, unmute your microphone afterwards. Okay, without any further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Dr. Ryan. Gina, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute your microphone, and it's over to you. Hi everyone, uh, sorry that we were a bit late. We had a last minute uh, thing we were trying to deal with. And because of that, um, in order for me to see your faces, I might go back and forth between the, the presentation and this, but that's not a problem. It is wonderful to be here, uh, stage or mirror, that's what we're talking about. And, uh, and it was a, such, a, such a great keynote this morning and I found a lot of links to what we're going to be talking about today. And so, uh, really, this is a chance to pause and think about what we're doing in this rapidly changing, crazy world of ours. So it's really a point to reflect, you know, and as I was thinking um, or listening to Craig speak, and I, I really, I really buy into this, you know, we're co-creating. And so that's something we're doing now is we're co-creating meaning with our identity as online educators. Um, you know, and something else he said was, you know, that, that learn, unlearn, relearn. I really, really like that. And um, one, of, uh, one of the reasons why I actually decided to propose this, um, this topic is I'm really interested in identity. So I proposed it and it was accepted, but I actually, I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't done any of the work. And so then I thought, okay, I better, I better get on this. And so there's a point maybe six weeks ago where I thought, well, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. That's kind of my mantra all the time. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and that's, um, then I know, okay, I'm on the right path whenever I have those moments. And I think that links a lot to this willingness to be uncomfortable, this discomfort that comes with adapting and going back to what Craig was saying, um, you know, we learn, we unlearn and that's uncomfortable and then we relearn. All right, so that was actually a little bit uh, that wasn't part of my spiel, um, but here we go. I'm going to share my screen with you and um, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum, desktop. All right. And uh, Dave, please tell me if this isn't, if something isn't going well, okay? Wait, wait, okay. Can everyone see? Dave, can everyone see? Yeah, okay. All right, so um, this discussion, is intended as a place to play, pause and think about our situation as educators in a time when technology continues to be more pronounced uh, in most of our, in all of our collective lives really due to COVID-19 and with so many of us and so many schools online, on and off, on and off. This workshop is actually a plenary. So it's a group discussion and it's intended to be interactive in nature. So please be brave, raise your hand to chime in to the discussion or share your thoughts in the chat. And myself or Dave will read your answers out loud. And it might have to be Dave because in order for me to present in this way, I can't see everyone. <laughs> um, so the takeaway is really the discussion itself. 
it's, you know, how, so how it's going to work is I'm going to provide a bit of food for thought by briefly introducing a research topic or a theory. And we're going to use some questions that I've made to guide our group discussions. So please take out a piece of paper and a pen or have somewhere on your computer or your phone to type down your thoughts. And while I really hope we get everybody participating and sharing their thoughts, you are not obliged to share. Don't worry, we're not gonna put anybody on the spot. Hey, I didn't see, I saw you didn't share. No, no. So you can be an active listener, an active thinker, and that's fine. But we, we hope to hear from you though. That's kind of the point. Um, I also wanna point out before we really get going, I don't have any hidden agenda. And if I do, it's also hidden from me. Um, and I'm not interested in changing anyone's minds. Um, so I, I think this kind of mirror or stage might give some people you know, the thought that there's a dichotomy and I don't see a dichotomy. I just thought that was a cool title. And so to that end, um, I've tried to make the questions neutral and, um, and, and there are some there that are intended to provoke, uh, but yes, that's the idea. So there's, we're just here to discuss and think. All right, one other little thing really before we get going. Um, you know, I, I kind of got into uh, the online game a bit, a lot later than I think a lot of people. And so I just wanna point out, you know, I, I think there's a lot of benefits to creating an online presence as a professional educator. I was in an air cost workshop led by Alec Kourous a few years back in the Philippines in 2016. And at, at that workshop, he explained how, well, the value of controlling uh, the content you put forth as an educator. So it's basically you can control to a degree where and how you appear in search lists. That was a bit of an aha moment for me. And so it's this idea that as educators, we may be building our sense of self, our image and our professional profile. And before that workshop, I was actually pretty hesitant to put myself out there, which is kind of unusual because I'm a performer and that's what I do. Um, but I really think that uh, online identities as educators has, you know, has the potential to really serve us. All right, so let's get started. Um, mm -hmm. Can I ask that everybody put their name, school, and um, their online teaching experience and platforms they use in the chat? So if you could tell us your name, the school. So I'm Gina, I teach at Prem here in Chiang Mai. And uh, this is my school. So I'm at school in sunny Chiang Mai. And I've worked with ManageBack, Google Classroom, Engage, and I, I have a platform. Uh, my platforms are YouTube and my website. And I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see. All right. Dave, can you just give me a thumbs up if, if everything, okay. All right, so we'll do it that way. And um, let me just- Yeah, I think people are still chatting, too, so we'll just let them, we're still typing, sorry. Great, okay. And we'll go on this to you. Oh, but you guys can't see them. So again, name, where you are, and what platforms you've used, basically. I can read these out also, Gina. So if you want, you want to go ahead and share your screen, that's no problem. Okay, perfect, great. Okay, so we have joining us today, Natalie Bills, one of our very own from Saigon South International School. Um, Natalie uh, uses YouTube and working on a personal website at the moment. Oh, all right. Well, let's let's move on. I think because we have a lot to discuss. Um, but if if you as people uh, contribute, that would be wonderful. All right. Uh, so here we go. All right. All right. So um, this so Cooley's Looking Glass is a bit of a different take on the word mirror. Sociologist Charles Cooley theorized that we base our self-image on how we think other people see us. And he calls this the looking glass self. And it happens in three stages. How we think, how do we appear to others? And then we think, how do they judge me? And then we revise what we think about ourselves. 
So it's this kind of process of creating equilibrium between how we want to be seen and how we perceive we are seen by others based on our interactions with them. But what's notable here is that um, we're basing this on our imagined assumptions, on our perceptions. Uh, so our perceptions may or may not be correct. Uh, so let's take a moment to read the following questions. Uh, there's no need to respond to all of them. You can pick one or two. Uh, you're encouraged to take a screenshot. Here they are. Um, and this, this goes uh, for all upcoming discussions in every slide. Um, just to feel free to pick one or two. So the questions are, who do we presume to be our audience? How do we perceive their evaluation of us? What interactions or feedback are these evaluations based on? And what's different about online interaction versus face-to-face -face in relation to the looking glass self? And we can sit here for you know maybe five minutes. And I've asked Dave to, you know, every six minute point to kind of give me a little heads up. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Just to clarify, are we writing this in the chat or are we sharing out loud? Either, oh yes, either or. So okay. share out loud, please, yeah. And okay. yeah, Dave, you can see the, the hands raised, right? I can indeed. So just let me know when you'd like to start. Um, right away, right away. Okay, yeah, no problem. So um, uh, once you've uh, had some time to think and you've jotted down some responses, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, I'll call upon you to unmute your microphone. Thanks. And, and Dave, as we wait, is there a way for me to um, keep these questions so people can read them, but so I can also see faces? Because I want people to be able to have access to this. I know we got uh, stuff. Sorry, uh, do, you know, do you mean after the chat or during the workshop? No, during, yeah, during the workshop, yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, probably the best way to do that is for people to actually uh, use their microphones and use their raised hand and speak out loud. That's probably the easiest way because of the issues that we're having with your screen. Um, it's hard for you to see that the questions coming through the, the chat feature, but I can definitely right. share these. I can share the chat um, transcript with you afterwards. And so we can always continue the conversation on Hoover. All right, I just want to see faces. All right, sure. Go, let's go ahead and hear from people. Okay, so we have um, Juliet. Juliet, if you would like to unmute your microphone. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess in response to some of the questions that you posed, um, I think I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, but about the fourth question, uh, the difference between um, online interactions and face to face in terms of uh, their, you know, our perceptions of how students feel about who we are as teachers. Um, I think. What I find really difficult, and even given this presentation, you know, half an hour ago, we felt um, there's just that that lack of interaction, that lack of seeing the response of what um, people think of what you're saying. It's really mm -hmm. difficult to gauge understanding, and I think the engagement from both the student perspective and also as teachers, you know, like we're we're teachers because we don't want to necessarily sit in front of a computer all day. And so I, I just find that a hugely uh, influential in my own motivation, engagement, and really like even just energy, um, the online interaction, you know, the perception of our utility and I don't know, even perceived sort of like do students, you know, are they interested in what we're saying? Are they getting what we're saying? Having that complete lack of interaction from the other side can be yeah, really draining. I think, in the online context. Thanks, Juliet. Thank you very much. And uh, Natalie, you'd like to offer something. Yes, I was looking at uh, question number one, who do we presume to be our audiences? I thought about that a lot in recent times. I think when I first started using um, educational platforms online for, for my job, I was thinking of students as the audience. Um, and then I started thinking of parents as the audience during virtual school last year, uh, because parents were the adults at home with their children. Um, but now thinking in terms of professionally, I think of you know future schools I might work at. They are definitely an audience of my online presence. Um, I think of 
uh, other educators that I don't even know who might do a Google search and come up with something that I posted about what I'm doing in my classroom. So my sense of audience has gotten much bigger um, as I've explored this. Great, thanks Natalie. And I think that's all of the questions on this section. Tina? Great, well, we can move on because I, I think that uh, any, any bit of time gain will, will help us a lot. All right, thank you for sharing. Um, all right, the next one. Oops. Oh dear. Ah. Okay, avatars, cyber selves. Um, so an article from um, Leslie University furthers this notion of looking glass in an online context. Through social, me social media and online platforms, we create a cyber self. In fact, we may create several, several cyber selves for different settings. We choose a version or versions we want to display, and we sometimes or often invest time in curating these identities. And these ideas now are borrowed from Mary Aiken in her book, The Cyber Effect, a pioneering cyber psychologist explains how human behavior changes online. Uh, and I should point out that's a very controversial book. But anyways, uh, she points out as a result of online identities, there are multiple mirrors. Uh, we have full exposure via social media and social media feedback or interaction, if you will, happens even when we're not present. So there's a lot going on. So let's think about these questions. What strategies, if any, of extension do you use? How does our online presence and or use of online platforms impact our connection with students? What feedback have you received from your students about your avatars and or Bitmoji classrooms? And does the need to appear change who we are and how we are mo motivated? So let's take a couple of minutes to reflect on those. Um, and then I, I can't wait to hear from people and their answers. Um, I, I've heard back from my students, I use a Google uh, classroom, I created one with Google Slides last year and it got a really good response. I haven't actually made a Bitmoji myself. That's because I have a really old phone and I don't, I can't access the app. I would though, I think they're fun. All right, I'll stop talking so you can think and I look forward to hearing responses. You know, and as, as I was reading this um, about cyber selves and really reflecting on, on how many identities we can have as educators, as people, and thinking about our own children and students, uh, it's, it's, it's really mind boggling when you think about it and, and unlimiting. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what people have to say. Natalie? Um, I don't use as many strategies of extension. I do have a Bitmoji, um, but what I've learned from my students is that Bitmojis are often used by people my age and older. That is not something that the kids use. Um, they use other things. Uh, when you click on their, you know, when you, even on Zoom, they have a picture of their favorite video game when their face isn't showing, or they've gone on to one of the online character creation websites and made an avatar that looks like them. Um, so actually that's an interesting thing to talk to kids more about. Um, when I think of my, on, my online self, I think more of the personality, less about the picture I put forward, um, but it's interesting to think about it in terms of the visual. So that's something I wanna ask my students about more since they, they themselves are so adept at this, or at least they think they are. Oh, that's hilarious how we date ourselves, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah, the personality versus the visual. And a lot of students are using, you know, full on videos, which is really interesting. 
how we how we express ourselves in these new ways. Natalie, that um, that whole thing about the students saying too that bitmojis are for for older people <laughs> reminds me of something a student said to me maybe eight or nine years ago when talking about Facebook. She said Facebook is for mums, and that was eight or nine years ago. So yeah, yeah, we, we think we think we think we're on top of things, you know. <laughs> Right, right. Okay, I think uh, that's um, all of the responses we have for this particular section, Gina. Okay, great, we'll move on. All right, uh, different teaching scenarios. All right, so this one, um, it's not really, it's kind of giving yourself to a time to think about um, how we appear in different teaching scenarios and to consider possibly our spectrum of visibility. So I'd like to ask you, how does your teaching look differently in the following six different scenarios? Only, only with only students present, filming your student, filming yourself with students present, being watched by a colleague. So if you have a, a wow program at your school, watching others work, um, being watched by a supervisor, maybe for review, online teaching. So uh, a, a platform hosted internally by your school, and then online teaching if you make what you do more public. So for example, YouTube or your website or, or something else that, you have, that you're using. You know, and, and when I think about my own experience, um, when, I'm, when I'm with the students, I've been at the school for 10 years, I feel very at home with the students, very at home here. I'm not really self-conscious, I'm just kind of me. Uh, and the moment I, I film myself, so sometimes I'll film myself conducting um, or to listen to how I'm speaking because I tend to speak very fast, just to give myself some feedback, my behavior changes right away. Um, and I, I'm just hyper aware of everything I'm saying and everything I'm doing. And, and I, even with the YouTube videos I make, I, you know, I, I try to be pretty casual, um, try to be me, but Again, it's, you know, I will do many takes before I'll actually choose one. And obviously we don't have many takes when we're teaching live. So I'll stop talking, let everybody think. And I, and I hope to hear how you all gauge um, your teaching in these six different scenarios. What about you, Dave? Oh, I'm doing, I'm doing some very heavy thinking here. Oh, okay. Especially on number, especially on number four. <laughs> and I should say, please don't feel bad about silence. I don't mind. I think people need time to think. So that's, that's kind of built into this. And we can spend a little bit more time, I think, on each slide if people need more time to think. Um, I just want to share something that a friend of mine said, um, we're big, we're big tabletop gamers. Um, and so we were talking about teaching in terms of tabletop role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. And one thing she said was, regardless of your personality, every teacher has taken a couple levels in Bard. Um, so we all have that performance that we have to put on, it might not be our personality. Um, but we all kind of have to put on that performance for teaching. And for some of us, it's more natural than others. Um, for me, I, I, the, I lean toward that anyway, even in my social life. So the performing, and it is performing for me, it's, it's fine. It's not a problem when there are other people in there. Um, it's reminding kids that they are seeing a performance, that they're not necessarily seeing me. Yeah. Absolutely. That's actually going to tie a little bit into the next uh, into the next slide on uh, Goffman's dramaturgy, like that front stage self and a backstage self. So we we yeah, you're right. We're all performing. We're not really 
showing everything about ourselves, which is probably a good thing. I think number three is um, very interesting because I feel like it's probably something that isn't very widespread in in schools and in education, but mm -hmm. that the research shows that it is probably one of one of, if not the most effective way to become better at what we do when we have the opportunity to not only to gain feedback, but to to act on that feedback, especially when that feedback comes from our peers. I know it's something we here at SSIS have been talking about um, bringing more into in terms of our professional learning and professional growth. Yeah, we had a program here at Prem called WOW, Watching Others Work. Um, that was, I, I heard that was quite um, prominent before I arrived. And um, I think we've tried to bring it back to life in many different reincarnations. Um, and the times that we have, it's, it's been really great, uh, but we certainly could be doing it a lot more. It's, it's, I, I love watching other people and you get so much. And um, Craig was saying, you know, in, that, in the keynote that our professional development, the opportunities, our communities are, are really our schools. And I don't think we, we take advantage as much as we could be, definitely. Okay, I think that's all the responses we have for this section, Gina. All right, we'll move on, we'll move on. And I think if we have time at the end and people wanna share some, some thoughts that come to them as they go, we can always backtrack, it's not a problem. I sure, and just for your reference, that's exactly halfway through the workshop duration. Okay, oh good, great, we're doing very well then. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, uh, this next slide is about Goffman's presentation of self. And so in that, in that previous slide, I had us thinking about audience. So who are we in front of? Who's watching us? And so his theory is called dramaturgy. Irvin, Irving Goffman uh, was a sociologist and believed that we try to manage how we present ourselves to others, what he calls impression management. So like I was saying before, we have this front stage self and we have a backstage self. And basically we play roles depending on context and who is around. And so most people get to see our front stage selves and over time you allow people backstage. So I guess the question is, who is our audience? So I'm gonna ask that question again over and over. And do we change how we perform, so teach, depending on who is watching us? And you know, we could have asked these questions 20 years ago and be relevant, but now we have so many more things to think about. So here are the questions. Again, who is our audience? And do we change how we perform depending on who is watching us? How do we engage in impression management? Um, so for example, uh, appearance, our clothes, hair, makeup, props in the background. You know, I, I have a pretty messy shelf and I put this fan up and you know, I, I made a bit, of an, a bit of an effort. I even put on makeup, which I usually don't do. Uh, so, you know, how do we, I sh so but then I've destroyed the illusion. <laughs> um, uh, how do we engage in presentations uh, of self in our day-to-day -day lives? And how is it different when we do this through online platforms as education? Or is it different? And then the last question to think about, and again, you don't have to answer all of these now. You can take a screenshot and click on them later. Um, but shtick or genuine? So do we want to create a different persona or person? Are we casual like Mr. Dress Up and Mr. Rogers? Or do we want to present a personality, kind of an extending our sense of self? And this could, again, relate to how we set up videos, uh, create an atmosphere, how we choose to dress, um, how we choose to do our hair. So what's that front stage, backstage balance? Is it more or is it less? when we're on the screen. So let's take a couple of moments to think about that.
All right, maybe this is a symbol of uh, me not being comfortable with wait time as a teacher, but I feel like I need to jump in and say something again. Uh, so um, I, think, I think we do change how we perform based on who's watching us. Um, I mean, even if we're, we're pretty good about always having the same uh, level when, when the principal walks in, we're probably going to make sure that we don't use the slightly harsh tone with the kid who keeps being obnoxious, right? So we all do kind of change how we perform. Um, I really like the question about shtick or genuine. Um, and I think that, I, I don't know the correct answer to that question, but I think that that question um, is going to be different in different circumstances. I mean, obviously when a student is come, coming to you with a problem, you, you don't want the shtick necessarily. You want to be genuine with them, but maybe not so genuine that you're saying things like, I also deal with this and have also seen a therapist for this. Like they don't, they don't need that. So it is about finding that balance. I think a shtick is okay. I think it's okay if you have your teacher persona, um, but finding the balance I think is the real question. And I'd be curious to see um, what others in this chat have, how you've navigated the shtick versus genuine. Yeah, I agree with you, Natalie, definitely. Um, I find myself sometimes falling into shtick when I don't actually mean to. It's kind of like just the, the autonomous kind of just takes over. And I think you're right. I think it's important just to take a step back and ask ourselves what, um, which mask we should have on at different times and when it's most appropriate and really be responsive to the needs of not just our, our students, but also colleagues just in, in my role as a coaching role. Um, I, the, no, the question three really interests me because it just reminded me of a struggle I had when I first, I mean, the whole kind of concept of screen recording and screen castifying became a thing that I guess maybe, I want to say maybe around 10, 10, to 10 years ago when it, you know, things like um, screencast o -Matic and the other big one whose names escape me right now started kind of making their way into education and people realized they could create these screen recordings and I would be, I would spend 45 minutes making a five minute recording because if I got one word wrong, I would stop it and go back to the very beginning and do the whole thing all over again. And then it just, I, I watched a, a, a workshop or a presentation from someone else about five years later who was like, if that was really in class, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't start the sentence all over again. So don't do it when you're recording you, yourself using your webcam. If you sneeze or the, and if you're recording it at home and the, the dog barks, just continue and say, oh, sorry about that. And, you know, and go on. But I think in, when people first start entering this realm of the camera being, you know, or you, of you being center screen, we often feel like we have to get it absolutely perfect for our audience. I mean, we'd never do that in a physical setting. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a really good point. It also really is a time saver when we can kind of accept those things. It's almost actually that remind, that makes me think of, you know, how I don't know how many years ago um, when cartoon makers started making sure that everybody blinked, like their, their cartoons blinked to, to show more uh, humanness. Do you, do you all remember that? So people like if you watch cartoons now, the cartoons are blinking. And so I think keeping those elements of, of life in our presentations in our online videos can actually serve us quite well. I've often thought about shtick or genuine um, or genuine, just like I, I try to be a little bit more me, but um, I think that there can be a lot of value in shtick. Like I think of primary and elementary school teachers like that could kind of dress up. There is, and I, I wish I could remember his name. There was um, a science teacher and he has a huge YouTube following and he kind of puts on a persona. I guess, you know, that's great if you're sharing for the world. I, I wonder if you do put on the persona and you're back in the class with your students, will they find it hard to relate to you? Or, you know, cause you're a personality, a different personality or, you know, is that creating any blocks or maybe you're even more relatable? What do you guys think? Anyone? Cognitive load is heavy this morning, Gina. You're really preaching our thinking. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that's okay. No, that's good. Yeah. These, like these, these are all great questions. 
if, if I could see faces, it would be so much easier. Yeah. I could see the, the thinking happening. So I'm sorry, everyone, I can't see your faces. If I, I, ha I have to sacrifice my comfort of seeing your faces so we can keep the, the questions on, on the screen. That's okay. I think some of us may also be having slightly um, lower bandwidth because most people have, have switched to audio, um, but that's okay. Oh, okay. 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 Um, should we, do we want to move on for now? Oops. Sorry. I just moved on without. Yeah. yeah, we'll move on, but I'm thinking we're doing really well for time. So if we end up getting to 1050, we, I can kind of backtrack through all of them, remind us what we've covered and we can kind of have a, you know, a, a clue up session together in some of these ideas. Cause I know I'm asking um, some pretty heavy questions here of you. <laughs> all right. And I've had a lot of time to think about this where I'm just introducing it. This next one um, is called Practitioner Teacher Identity. So in her book, Practitioner Teacher Inquiry and Research, Carolyn Babione looks at practor, practitioner teacher identity. She discusses how our identities are influenced by our personal and professional contexts and how we are going through another major societal change. And actually it's, it's great because Craig alluded to that in, in many times, I think in his, in the keynote today. And the fact, you know, that um, in her book, but it relates to what Craig was saying, I'm just gonna try to meld the two without looking at my notes. Um, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, education was there for a purpose. So people would get employment, right? So you'd go into the trades and you'd have, you'd secure a job. You'd go into academia, you'd secure a job. And she, she mentions that, you know, 20 years ago, a different stage happened. And that was jobs weren't necessarily there. What we were being trained for was no longer. So then, you know, people start asking, well, why are we going to school? What's, what's the purpose of this? And, and she said, we're now in the next, um, you know, part of that the next stage really the world's in flux and um especially with uh, you know global electronic forms giving new mean to new meaning to identity she argues that many teachers continue teaching as they were taught and that's true um and so this like that's a world where the our identities are very fixed and you know where schools and communities were were more uniform or at least trying to make everybody more uniform and so she says, you know, with, with the internet and with um, this possibility of, of new meaning to self-identity, it challenges a fixed or static identity of, as we have often known. So going back to the idea of mirrors, right? We've got our self, but even with that, just plain old self, there's so, so much to unpack. But then we start including the cyber selves and all of those mirrors. Um, and so, and this is not just for us, right? It's for our, for our students, for our children, um, for the next generation. So our current reality and classrooms are diverse and they're constantly changing. And we can strongly argue that um, it doesn't fit previous models of teaching. Another relevant point uh, in her book is she says that schooling needs to now compete with, with entertainment. Um, and she, and really, and the point of her book, Practitioner Teacher Identity, she says that historically teachers have not been encouraged to engage in their own research into their teaching. And so it's kind of left up to the academics, the people at the university to come in and research us. You know, while it has value, um, uh, she believes that the missing piece of uh, the puzzle piece um, can help us, like for us, for us to, to be our own researchers, can help us construct knowledge about our teaching and classrooms which may help us better understand and better respond to in real time to the rapidly changing classroom and to our students and to what it means to be a teacher in the 21st century. <laughs> so how do we ensure that our 21st century teaching methods reflect the changing needs of our students? And so, so this, this particular discussion is about um, thinking about that research. So here's some questions. How have our classrooms, communities, and students changed in the past decade, or even five years, or even last year? How have we adapted our teaching to meet these needs? And we can think about online, we can think about a lot of different ways. How do we inquire into and research the effectiveness of our own approaches, and of our new approaches? And how do we see our current use of technology in the classroom impacting the needs of our students? 
And impacting is a word I, I wanted to point out. It's not a negative or, or it can be negative or positive impacts um, of the needs of our students. So I'm going to stop for a moment, let us everybody think, and I hope to hear from some of you. I'm just gonna mute so you don't hear my breathing. And just a gentle reminder that uh, please don't feel like you have to answer all of these questions now, but any any contributions will be coming up. Um, I think one of the uh, difficulties that I've had in at least the last year, maybe the last year and a half, um, with everything that's happening in the world is have, having the mental capacity to inquire into and research new approaches. Um, I know that last year when we all were very suddenly thrown into online, online teaching and learning, um, there wasn't time to really sit and assess the effectiveness of, of new approaches. We just kind of had to do it on the fly. And then at least, you know, we're very fortunate here in uh, Southeast Asia, in many places, things have calmed down, kids have gone back to school. Um, we had time to debrief on some of those situations. But um, as far as how do we inquire into and research, that's, that's a question that I would like answered as well, because sometimes I just feel like I don't have the, the mental capital, the social, the, the emotional capital to, it's like, well, I just got it done. I, I, I got to do the next thing. I don't have time to do. I don't have time to research the effectiveness of a new approach. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I struggle with, which um, yeah, getting back on the saddle when it comes to back in the saddle, when it comes to uh, researching new approaches. I, I think I think your point about uh, being here in Southeast Asia is we are lucky that we have had time to kind of things for most of us have calmed down and we are also back in school and we also took time to to debrief and think about what what worked for our school and what didn't work and we're continuing to do that and I think we can I mean I think now is a crazy time <laughs> anyways um, but when things really start to settle down I really think that uh, Babioni has a really good point though, as, as teachers just, um, you know, Craig's point was asking ourselves, why are we doing and that justification? Um, but, but then kind of once we've done something, trying it out to see, is it working? And, um, you know, there's, there's arguments that that can be um, just talking with students, like, so it doesn't have to be some kind of, it can be empirical research, but it can also be case studies and, and having those discussions and, and even looking at students' reflection and just, you know, finding, finding those approaches. Yeah. Her, her book, though, is, um, has, a, if, if this is something you're interested in, her, her book has a lot of strategies on, on how to think about research. Um, and so it's something that I'm starting to to get into right now with some projects that I'm I'm involved with. I think that's a great point, Gina, about that um, in-house research, that kind of that work workplace action research. Where just with reference to to question three, I mean, so much of what has come along in the past decade, or you know, even you think last 15, 20 years, there's very little longitudinal empirical, you know peer-reviewed research into these things, 
even now. So we're still kind of feeling our way through it and kind of fumbling in the dark. And you're right, like you, like you mentioned, it'll, it'll differ from school to school and it will depend on your context. But, in, and I feel like we, uh, inquiring into and researching the effectiveness is, is quite difficult, but there are different things we can do to um, inquire into potential impacts in our current situations. And I know something that um, maybe some of you might be familiar with, but I just came across this week actually through a PD that I was doing in school is um, strategic thinking as seeing, which was um, pioneered by, I believe the author's name was Mitzenberg. And so it's basically instead of that kind of traditional, you know, um, well, what are we already doing and what should we be doing kind of approach to, to different uh, initiatives. It's it's almost like six or seven different levels of seeing in terms of seeing um, behind when we think about you know what is the legacy of our of our school and what are the things that we want to honor. Then there's more kind of um, 360 degree balcony view seeing about seeing above. There's seeing the side when we start thinking about our different stakeholders and our our parents and our community. And I thought it was just a very 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 um, different approach to um, approaching the implementation or the um, furthering of a cause. So yeah, um, lots of different kind of aspects to that, I think. But I think that third one is something that is really hard in this day and age to actually research into because there's so little um, stuff out there. Well, you know, yeah, Babioni's point was also that, you know, as teachers were often, um, how do I say, the research is often coming from outside. And from a lot of empirical studies, you know, that have that, that you know that have value. I, I certainly think they do, anyways. Um, but but her point is more like you're saying, just that grassroots within our own communities. And so we're really responding to our students. And so that um, so that it's 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 really real time with 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 who 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 we're dealing with. And, and she was saying that, you know, because we haven't been encouraged or maybe don't have the time or don't think we have the time. That, that critical thinking, we're kind of living up to others to tell us, I mean, uh, this is a blanket statement, uh, but, um, but you know, it got me thinking about, you know, how do I, how do I look at what I'm doing? And it, it doesn't, sometimes it's this formal research that we can share. And there's certainly a movement in a lot of education circles to, for um, action, action research from, from teacher action research. Um, and, and I hope to continue to see it uh, because, because those localized, um, discussions can help us learn from each other um, because sometimes we think oh we can only learn from these you know these very big broad studies but sometimes it's often it's about sharing and reading each other's stories that I think we can grow um, if I just think about an example of my own teaching recently um, I just switched uh, I just switched um, an assignment a composition assignment where students used to note notate and then I had them using their digital, digital audio workstations, a really different approach. And I just, you know, I compared how effective um, both approaches were and I realized, okay, the second one actually was less effective even though I thought it'd be more. And so then how can I, but it has the potential to be, to be more. So then how can, I, how can I adapt it? So just that ongoing reflection and that critical thinking and hopefully even some of us publishing so we can learn from each other. Anyways, I don't want to. I don't mean to be the the talker. I want to hear from anyone else. Does anybody else want to contribute to this? We have two more slides to go, so I'm happy to move on. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to come back. Though. Wait, wait. Okay, this was um, social constructivism and online learning. I was originally going to start with this, but it got bumped to the end. Uh, this was part of the pre-reading. Don't worry if you didn't do it. You don't have to have read it. Um, but it was the first thing that actually got me thinking about online learning and this discussion. Uh, and so for anybody who might not remember or know what is social constructivism, it's really simply put, it's that the theory that we co-create knowledge together, we're active learners, learning takes place socially with others, it's subjective. And some might argue that depending on how we interact in our online platforms, uh, social constructivism and online learning may not fit well together. Some of us may then continue to be sage on the stage, which is not really what social constructivism is all about. However, the article that I shared with you for op optional reading uh, doesn't actually make that claim. So the author, 
Peter Doolittle does a great job uh, first of breaking down the tenets of constructivism and how they can apply to pedagogy and even discusses how online learning fares in relation to each suggestion. In fact, he grades them and it fares actually quite well. And so if you haven't had a chance to read that article, I think it's worth reading. Um, and so what I've done, um, but even if you haven't, don't worry. Um, what I've done is I've taken some of, the, of those pedagogical suggestions and created questions for us to consider here. And here they are. How do we or how can we engage in constructivist teaching and learning uh, with online platforms? And it probably should actually be constructivist learning, shouldn't it? Is online learning an authentic real world environment? How does online learning allow for interaction and social negotiation? How do students self-mediate in an online context? And finally, how do we organize multiple entry points? So let's give a, a think there. Love to hear from you. Just with regards to um, the point three, Gina, I think the interaction piece is definitely something that has improved a lot um, in the last five to 10 years. I mean, I remember trying, uh, uh, you'll be probably be very cognizant of this. I remember maybe 1999 when I first um, installed my first ever digital audio workstation. I think it was called uh, Reason. And I had no idea how to use it, literally not the first clue, but I find these uh, community forums, remember those things you used to have back in the day? And I'm trying to work out how to get the grips with this thing by sending text messages and emails back and forward and back and forward. And I'm pretty sure that what took me six months to get my head around through that method, nowadays would take maybe a day, two days max, via um, YouTube or another uh, online video video training course. So I think that um, the learning um, of new knowledge and skills has definitely become a lot more interactive. You think about well, just what we're doing here today, um, things like that live training, that sort of thing. Um, the social negotiation, I think, is slightly more complex because while video obviously adds that extra layer of um, you know, of, of the extra lens of being able to see people. There's a, there's a lot of other um, social cues that we can't pick up on when we're not actually in the same physical space as other people, especially large groups of people. So yeah, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag with that one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think it's gonna be mixed bags for, all, for a lot of them, really. When you think about question number two, it's possible the answer to that question 20 years ago would have been no, um, but maybe, well, today it's probably yes, because it's, it's such a place where a lot of our students live, if that makes any sense. And, you know, and when it comes to interaction, you know, we, we do miss out on, on those social cues and, and that touch and that seeing and being in each other's presence. At the same time, it might let people who are, who are shyer, um, you know, to, to have time to think and digest and then move forward their thoughts. I see we only have two minutes left. I'm just gonna bring us to the last slide because that's, that's the end. And um, just something to think about, teachers beware. Okay, <laughs> yes, positive note. Um, so really we're, we're in this age where we're all, we're all out there. We're putting ourselves out there. Um, we're risk takers and it's, and it's exciting and it's scary. And I just want us to think about some of these. So please feel free to contribute your suggestions and experiences. So we can move forward as educators, uh, being creative risk takers, but also managing to protect ourselves. So how do we protect ourselves online? And again, because this we're centering up, uh, around teacher identity, I'm focusing on us. Um, of course, we wanna think about our students, um, but what concerns do we have? Do we care if teachers are bullied at 
What point do we disable comments? How do we deal with comments? What are the risks when you put yourself out there and can students bully teachers? And so Dave, I'm not sure if we want to, we only have a minute left, if we just want people to kind of go away and think about that. If um, we just wanted to see if there's any overall questions before we... Yeah, we do have a little bit of a break between now and the next session, so we can, we're okay to go, to go a few minutes over. Right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually give myself the privilege of seeing everybody. So again, if everybody could just take a quick look at those questions, I'm going to stop sharing so I can finally see y'all. So it's really about protection. I mean, I have to say that so far I've been pretty lucky. I haven't had a lot of nasty comments, but I, I know that's pretty rare, especially with those more public platforms. I'm not sure if anybody else has had that experience. At our school, some teachers were worried last year. Um, we actually started preparing uh, for online teaching. In Chiang Mai, we have a smoky season. And so we were preparing for that in, um, in October, 2019. And so we were actually, we were probably one of the few schools ready for online learning when the pandemic hit. Um, but what, as we were going through training, a lot of teachers were really worried about their images being taken and manipulated and their videos, same, same thing. I'm wondering if anybody's had a similar experience. I don't think, I haven't heard anything actually happening. Has anybody had those experiences? I haven't had uh, anything like that happen to me, thankfully, um, but as a, as a relatively new parent um, of a two-year-old, it, it is very, very scary to see what young children can and are often are exposed to online. And just thinking about that as, a, as how I navigate that, uh, navigate those waters as a parent, especially when the pressure, the, or, or at least the perceived pressure from my child's friends and and peers and and school friends and classmates and other families is a real thing and i feel like that is for a lot of parents the biggest thing that they have to deal with the fact that you know those questions from children about but so and so is allowed to use this app why am i not allowed to and they've all got this device and why have i not got this device and you know i've spoken to some people recently i feel like we're just going to end up with communes around the world of people who want to completely disconnect from technology and and keep themselves away from it <laughs> but it's uh yeah it's it's a big bad world out there and yes i, I know that we have to enter it um without fear and and take these challenges head on but it's it, it really is a minefield as the technology gets smarter and we struggle to keep up with it. How do we keep our, our kids and our students safe whilst at the same time helping them also navigate this very this this minefield that, that they're placed in, seemingly from a very from an earlier and earlier age? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think that's that's all the time we have, isn't it? We've kind of gone over a little bit, and I know people need to take a screen break. Um, but I don't mind staying around for uh, I don't, Dave, what's what's the protocol? Yeah, I mean, I say we do have we do have a break. If there are any more questions, maybe now is a good time just to use the raise hand feature to raise your hand. And um, whilst I'm just waiting for that before we wrap up, uh, just to let you know that um, anything that any resources that were shared today, um, Gina, if you'd like to share them with me just via email, I can pop them up onto your Hoover oh, yeah, page yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. um, so the slides will be available. And Gina, if there's any links to any reading or other websites or whatever. If you just pop, pop them in the slideshow, maybe at the end, and save it as a PDF with the active links, then we'll know that. Oh, perfect. There we go. So I will share that uh, with everyone on the Hoover app. If there are, I know, obviously, this is a very kind of heady topic. It, it's very timely. It's very relevant, but one that you might want to go away and do some more thinking about. And some questions might pop up later today or even, or even next week. If you'd like to continue the chat, please do so using the Hoover app. You can continue to ask questions from Gina that way. You can share email addresses, keep in touch etc um after this zoom call and of course the recording will be placed on the, the hoover app afterwards if you'd like to come back review the video if there's anything that piques your interest but, um so just before we wrap up um i'd like to thank gina very much for her time today and if you could all give a a, a zoom round of applause for gina thank you so much that was awesome and enjoy the rest of your day enjoy the rest of vtc and have a great saturday bye see you